What action or emotion do you hope that this film inspires within its audiences? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, I think we live in a pretty selfish age of social media and everything's about me and part of the problems and the epidemic of youth mental illness has to do with a kind of essential loneliness social media isn't. So what I would like is emotion. I think that's it. I don't want to tell the audience. We don't want to tell the audience how to feel. We want people to be engaged emotionally. My very first film, almost 50 years ago, I said that I wanted to be an emotional archeologist, excavating not just the dry dates and facts of a subject, but, but something else, something higher, not sentimental or nostalgic. And I hope particularly with this critical story that what we do is just arouse people beyond the kind of general state of disconnection that I think not just young people, but everybody uh, is in today and a sense of not belonging. And I hope that, that we can form within the film a sense of sympathies and, and, and a sense of community with the people who are involved. Thank you. Did you and the Ewers brothers think it would be difficult to find people who are willing to discuss such difficult topics? You know, Eric and Chris are wonderful filmmakers and I really just have to, and I should have said at the very beginning, serving as executive producer means that I'm really at a far remove. I had the great opportunity to look at a, at a fine cut and uh, encourage them and help them all the way along the way, but look at a fine cut and I, and I realized, you know, this film has the possibility of saving lives. Um, but I think as filmmakers, whatever the subject, and I can't speak for Eric or Chris, though I understood at the time their anxieties, like how do you open up? I've worked with them long enough that that's a question that I've had, that they've had, and then you, you figure out how to do that. And I think what's so remarkable is that you have 20 young people here who have really bared their souls, who have said, this is who I am. This is what I went through and am going through. This is how I got out of it. You know, it's like Dante's Inferno. He leads you into hell, but then he does have this part that leads you out to Paradiso. And you, and you don't feel for a moment with any of the people that they're beyond hope or redemption. And in fact, despite our woeful record on this as adults, as a society, that there are solutions, there, are, there is help to be had and that nobody's problem is so insurmountable uh, that it can't be helped just by, by, by bringing together. You know, I have, I've got four daughters and um, early on in my life when I was struggling with things, um, somebody, and I don't remember who told me what they thought were three things and I kind of developed them and, and got them together. And, and I've now for the last 40 years been sharing that with everybody I know who's struggling and with, um, uh, with my daughters. And some people come up to me after 25 years and say, here's the post-it that you wrote down. And the three things are very simple and there's no real yes buts to them. You know, um, this will pass, right? Whatever is the worst thing about this moment will actually change. Maybe it'll get a little bit worse. Maybe it'll get a lot better, but it's nothing ever is static. To get help from others, and to be kind for you, to yourself. The last one's impossibly hard for any of us to do, even now. But I, I think the fact that we were able to, that, that, that Eric and Chris were able to get so many extraordinary stories tells you the hunger and the sense of isolation that people feel, not just with illness, not with their particular stories, but all of us feel. And we wish to reach out and we wish to recreate a community. And I, I think the film has the possibility of having a kind of national effect that people will suddenly see the intimacy of their stories. They're not too different from mine or they're, they're not too different from my friends who, or, or that. And that suddenly we might be able to reassemble in a new way that you know just doesn't mean. I mean, when I say that social media isn't, if you look at a group of people, teenagers or adults, and they're all in the same room and they're all on their phones, that's not connected to those people. And I think there's a price that we pay for that isolation. Obviously COVID accelerates it to the nth degree, but, but so many other contributing factors, just that life itself is hard and a lot of people are gonna be dealt some very complicated hands and we wanna figure out a way to be there for them.
What are some of the common themes you notice in terms of shared or common experiences among the stories you captured? You know, I think it's hard to put my finger on that. As I look at the film, I think what's so unique is that impulse to, to share. Each person seemed to have their own private drama, as all of us do. You know, it's the existential question. None of us are getting out of here alive, period. So what do we do? What is our purpose here on earth? What, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm very fortunate. I knew at age 12, I wanted to be a filmmaker by age 18, that it was documentaries and, and by 22 in American history. That makes me a, one of the few lucky ones that that was just sort of completely. But so I think that what I, what I felt was a sense that the, whatever it was, whatever the diagnosis is, is unimportant but you could feel the sense of hopelessness that they felt at one point along that journey. And then you can feel, I think what unites all of them, Angel, is that they, they're all ferociously honest, you know, and we're not that way, you know, how you doing? Fine. You know, they're, they're ferociously honest. They tell you how they feel. And I, I was so stunned. I was moved to tears many, many times just by the, the sheer honesty, how difficult it is to say, not only that I'm hurting, but that this is the, this is the dissection of that. It's like science class where you're taking, you know, where it's the frog, but it's themselves. And so I think while the diagnoses, the symptoms, everything changes across, there's that just sense of honesty. And I think with that, you see that that's the key to getting better. It's how you engage with all the resources that are there to help, how you engage with the people who care for you and love for you, love you and who may be you know, part of the problem and you may be part of the problem for them and having a hard time expressing. It gives us an opportunity, I think, with that honesty um, to not make the other wrong, you know, which is what we kind of do all the time and to take it upon ourselves, our own responsibility to help us get better without that. And that doesn't in any way negate getting help from others or being kind to yourself. It just says, this is happening to me. And I was just stunned by how honest people were, by how honest they were. Was this a project you've been wanting to tackle or did it find you? Well, it found me and I'm a very, very busy filmmaker. And it was one of those things where I said, I cannot be the producer and director. This is an important project. And I had, you know, two very, very talented uh, people in our family who were willing to take it on. Eric Ewers has been for 20 plus years, 30 years, an editor at, at Florentine Films and one of the very best editors we've ever had and continues to be a great editor. And in the last 15 or so years, we also hired his brother, Chris, uh, who's a beautiful cinematographer. We'd had one that I have worked with for more than 50 years and Buddy Squires is his name, but Buddy can't be there for everything. So we were in the habit of, of hiring uh, Chris who did has an extraordinary unique eye and we'd worked together, the three of us, on a film about the Mayo Clinic and together with Julie Kaufman, one of the producers. And the four of us, I saw how, how immensely talented they were and how uh, dedicated to getting in and getting the best stuff and how, how in their outward facing appearance, they give the reassurance, particularly in a subject like this, that they can, they can handle it. So for me, it was like, I can't do this. Can you guys do this? I will serve as the backstop. I will be the name that will help raise the money. I will be this, but I can't be all of the things I usually am. And, and they said, yes. And then when they did it, um, I was just, they would call me with problems or with excitements about how we'd been to this place and filmed a young woman who spoke about this and you were like enthusiastic, but you know, this had to be done. Most of the stuff we do is deep in history, but this is a contemporary problem that is not unique to anyone in history. It's just at epidemic levels. And so it just requires um, our attention in that regard. And I think uh, Chris and Eric and Julie and their team have done a magnificent job. As a filmmaker and as a father, what did you take home from this film? 
Well, I just, I, I think a lot of what I've said, I, I just, I sort of felt there's hope. And in fact, I find myself as I talk, I've got two, four daughters, two are grown with kids of their own. Both of them have daughters of their own. Um, but then I have two younger daughters, 11 and 17. And, and, you know, they're going through variations of a lot of this, maybe not as severe and maybe not yet. I don't know. Um, and so I found myself just, I don't know how to put it, but being able to take in some of the hope and the, and the, and the sort of sense that it is possible to work through this and bringing it back to them when their problems are, you know, getting louder and louder or, or subsiding. And, and they are very well versed with the three things of this won't last, uh, get help from others and be kind to yourself. And I, I don't want to suggest that this won't last means tough it out. It doesn't. It just means that the hopelessness that attends the sense of, of that moment the terror of that particular moment will change and morph in, in some ways. And, and, and the second thing is really important that we need to, to tap the resources. We need as a country to not pay lip service to mental illness as we mostly do, but to actually do it. And it is so heroic to see in the film, not only the way uh, the various witnesses describe their journey and the honesty required uh, to do it and the amount of pain they suffered in the course of it is almost, I'm not sure it's unavoidable, but it seems in the case, you just got to go through and, and live with this. Just how, how heroic some of the people, the therapists were that were able to help them, the teachers who cared about them, the people who were able, the family members who were trying to come to terms with it. All of that tells us that we're all not independent free agents, but we are all bound to each other. And, and, and as Dr. King said, you know, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutual born a uh, tied in a single garment of destiny you know i mean that's what this film says in in every breath and and the tragic events in texas uh of the last you know couple of days have have you know reaffirmed our need to address mental health issues but also many many other issues in society and and to not you know in some cases just blame it uh, on mental illness. We're, we're all in this together and we, we sink or swim together. Are there any other projects um, surrounding mental health that you hope to focus on in the future? Yeah, I, you know, I think that the, I don't want to say the success of this, it hasn't come out, but the beauty of this and the, and, and my absolutely passionate conviction when I saw the fine cut back in December, that it was going to save lives, um, made us think, you know, we have to do this for the adult population. You know, this is not, let's not just say this is something that's endemic to kids, it's endemic to human beings because of how hard it is to be a human being for all of the reasons that we've discussed. Most notably, we're not getting out of this alive. And so the question of who we are and what we do and, and the way in which chemistry and, and circumstance, um, nature and nurture deliver us you know, the problems that we end up having, including mental health problems. And if they're not addressed in childhood, they're not necessarily just going to be outgrown or disappear. And so I think we're, it's incumbent upon us to sort of branch out and go further and, and talk about, you know, if, if you're going to educate people K through 12, you realize that the education for a lot of people doesn't end there. And, and when our founders said pursuit of happiness, they were not talking about the pursuit of objects in a marketplace of things. They were talking about lifelong learning in a marketplace of ideas. And so we would like to add to that marketplace of ideas the, the, the continuing story, drama, uh, pain, solutions, hope of uh, mental illness, period. Besides the pandemic, do you think there exists a stimulus in our society that can explain the increased mental health issues in youth and young adults? Yeah, I think so. Uh, let's just first say that growing up is tough. That's number one. Um, it's really hard with a pandemic, which has been so isolating for so many of us. Uh, and, and for some of us thrive in it, in the isolation. They, there's a difference between solitude and loneliness. Sometimes 
um, loneliness wins and that has its own impediments, you know, um, uh, Brandon, as, as, as I know, you know, I think, as I said, at the beginning of our conversation, social media ice has isolated us for a long time. There's a toxicity to it. I just finished a film on Benjamin Franklin and I gave a commencement address at, at the university that he founded the university of Pennsylvania. And I said, you know, he'd look at the web, he'd look at the internet and he said, I observe in nature that a, a web is a place where you get caught and then killed, you know? And so there's a lot that's very toxic about what is supposed to be bringing us together, but is only doing so artificially. And so even if it's the expectations, it's particularly tough as I know having daughters on young girls about expectations of how they look, but it's, it extends uh, to everyone. And, and then I think, you know, we live in a country that uh, worships money. We live in a country that worships guns. And all of that um, places false um, hopes in one area and assurances in another that don't exist. They just don't exist. Um, if what the gun people have been telling us uh, was true, then we would be the safest country on earth and our schoolhouses would not be uh, places of potential horrific disaster. I'm just finished a film on the Holocaust. It shouldn't be that elementary schools or high schools are places where you can have a mini Holocaust taking place, a mini example of genocide taking place. And if the gun advocates are right, we should be the safest country on earth and we are not. And all of those things, a fractured, divided politics that says that the, the person who doesn't believe in what I believe in is wrong and evil and the way the internet sort of exaggerates anonymously all of those things um, have, have, have essentially created a toxic environment that is incredibly hard for me at 68 years old to negotiate. How could it possibly not be challenging, Brandon, for people of your age and, and younger, you know, who are, are struggling to make sense of that? And so, you know, we've got a lot of, on our plates, but, you know, we also have within each of us and, and more importantly, collectively, the power to change things. Look, I, I, I've been making films about the United States, the U.S., I've been making films about the U.S. for almost 50 years, but I've also been making films about us. That is to say, the two letter, lowercase, plural pronoun, all the intimacy of us and we and our, and all of the majesty, the complexity, the contradiction, and even the controversy of the United States. It's been a beautiful space, complicated um, to occupy, but it's been my beat, the thing that I'm interested in. And I think that's, you know, um, gives us the possibility by studying the past to know a little bit about where we've been in order to know where we are and where we may be going. And that is the healthiest thing I can think of. Thank you guys so much for your questions and I'm really happy to be with you and to meet you. Good luck um, uh, with all the good things, good luck with all the bad things and get help from others and be kind to yourself. It won't last. <laughs>